What I would like to do is actually give you all a little bit of a physiology lesson to talk um, more in detail about just what's going on with the hormones of puberty in children that boys that have an XY karyotype and then in comparison in boys with an uh, XXY karyotype. Um, I will uh, start with the disclaimer that I have not done any research um, into children with Klinefelter syndrome. So I'm, I'm a clinician um, and I take care of these boys and I'm an endocrinologist, but I haven't participated in any of the data uh, gathering of this research. And so um, much of what I present um, perhaps has been uh, developed by some of these other uh, speakers. But with all that in mind, um, I'd like actually to start with a reminder of something that has been brought up a couple of times this morning and this afternoon. So uh, the prevalence of Klinefelter syndrome, it occurs in about one in every 500 to 750 male births. So we know that if you look at the karyotype of all infants, you know, if you take those blood spots that they got in all infants and look at the karyotype, it's about one in 500 to one in 750 male births. But when you look at how many individuals have been diagnosed with it, it's only about 25% of those. Now, there was a study in Australia where they were picking up almost half of them, but generally speaking, it's about one in, uh, one in every four. Um, in a situation like this, where not all of the individuals with the disorder are diagnosed, it's important to keep in mind whether the descriptions of those individuals that have been diagnosed differ from the uh, findings in individuals that haven't been. Um, so that when you look at studies, you know, studies that examine only those things that, uh, only those individuals that were diagnosed based on clinical features might not reflect the broad range of what could be seen in all individuals. Um, and in fact, generally, in situations like that, we expect those undiagnosed individuals to have less dramatic features. So that's this um, ascertainment bias that, that people have spoken about earlier in the day. And, you know, related to Klinefelter syndrome, studies that look at individuals diagnosed based on a prenatal karyotype, and especially a prenatal karyotype that was done not because of specific concerns, you know, so it doesn't count if the karyotype was done because it was an abnormal ultrasound or something, but if it was just a, 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 a amniocentesis that was done maybe because, you know, of maternal age or something, um, and Klinefelter syndrome was identified, you know, that's kind of an unselected population, and those are probably more representative of the broad range. But I think anything we say about XXY has to be taken with a grain of salt in that we don't really know the true prevalence and range of things in all individuals because of this ascertainment bias. So um, we do know, however, that a pretty consistent finding within Klinefelter syndrome is testicular failure. So this is some of the frequency rates for features related to testicular failure. Um, uh, including the very high rate of infertility and the decreased testosterone levels. Um, it still is a little uncertain about what the role of ascertainment bias has on this, but um, at least in the individuals that we're identifying, that's a fairly invariant aspect of it. And so much of what I'm going to talk about, the endocrinology of Klinefelter syndrome, is related to this testicular failure. So. I'm going to kind of keep it very basic and expand. Now, I don't doubt that many of you know probably just about everything that I'm going to say this afternoon, but um, hopefully it's helpful to hear somebody say it. Um, the testes in boys and men have two roles. Um, it, they make testosterone and they make sperm. So the role of testosterone production um, in a boy is that prenatally, that's what causes that fetus to virilize into a boy. Without testosterone, the fetus will develop into a girl. So that's absolutely necessary. It stimulates the growth of the penis late in gestation of the developing fetus. And it also will stimulate the descent of the testes into the scrotum. Now, in infancy, as has been mentioned earlier, there is this neonatal surge where testosterone levels rise and then fall again in those first couple of months of life. I think the only thing that can said, be said with certainty about that neonatal surge is that it happens. We actually don't know what the role of that neonatal surge is in boys. 
in adolescence, testosterone stimulates the development of those secondary sexual characteristics. Development of pubic hair, axillary hair, muscle mass, voice change, beard growth, all of that stuff. In adulthood, testosterone is clearly uh, most important for sexual function. It also maintains muscle mass, and then there's a number of other physiologic roles for it. But the main role of it in adulthood, um, and the main uh, unique role, is certainly in maintaining sexual function. In terms of sperm production, um, that's the uh, function of the testes beginning in adolescence and then obviously continuing into adulthood. So this is going to be very similar to a talk that I would give to medical students. Uh, production, uh, the, the uh, testes actually starts up in the brain where the hypothalamus makes a hormone called GnRH. That GnRH stimulates the pituitary gland also up in the head to make other hormones. So on this slide, talking about testosterone production, GnRH stimulates the production of LH. You've heard the discussions about LH um, uh, a lot. Uh, it's this LH from the pituitary that then travels through the blood down to the testes and stimulates the production of testosterone. Now this HPG axis, the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, um, is what we refer to in endocrinology as a classic feedback system, where that testosterone feeds back to the hypothalamus and the pituitary to control the production of all these hormones. So the way the body sort of knows there's enough testosterone is that testosterone level goes back up to the hypothalamus and pituitary, and if the level is right, then the hypothalamus makes the right amount of GnRH and LH. And if the testosterone level is not right, the GnRH and LH levels go up trying to increase it. So it has this negative feedback loop. With regard to sperm production, it's very similar. GnRH from the hypothalamus stimulates production of FSH from the pituitary gland. FSH travels in the blood down to the testes and stimulates the production of both sperm and then another hormone called inhibin. Um, it's the inhibin hormone that then serves as that negative feedback to the hypothalamus and pituitary to let the hypothalamus and pituitary know that essentially sperm production is going properly. If sperm production isn't going properly, inhibin levels aren't going up the way they should, and that FSH level will then rise. So this negative feedback loop in terms of LH and testosterone, inhibin and um, FSH, um, are why we use LH and FSH as these markers of testicular function. So, you know, as I was saying, you know, because of that feedback loop, normal levels of LH and FSH indicate that the testes are functioning normally. If the LH is above the adult normal range, that tells us that there's deficient testosterone production. Whereas if FSH is above the adult normal range, that tells us that there's deficient sperm production. So again, normal LH and normal FSH tell us that the, there's not a deficiency in testosterone and sperm production. And it's that elevation that is that clue that something's going wrong with the testes. Where does which? Um, SHBG. Yeah, so lots of hormones um, bind to a protein when they're in the blood to just kind of carry it around. And the amount of, so SHBG is the protein that testosterone binds to as it floats around in the blood. Um, and different people have different SHBG levels. Um, uh, and uh, that can affect the target testosterone level that the body would be aiming for, but it doesn't affect the action of testosterone. So that in, in thinking about whether there's enough testosterone or not, that LH becomes the gauge of that, and it's independent of whether the SHBG level is high or low. It kind of accounts for those differences. So um, this is what hormone production looks like throughout childhood. So you know, there's early hormone production um, in the developing fetus. 
it goes down right after birth, but then you have this little neonatal surge in the first couple of months of life. And then as you've heard about earlier, there's very low hormone levels during childhood until you get into puberty when all of those hormone levels rise. So I put this up graphically and then we'll kind of go through it in a little bit more detail and talk about you know, what that means in, in XXY individuals. So um, in um, XXY boys, um, during that neonatal surge, the LH, FSH, and testosterone levels look very similar to the levels um, that are seen in puberty. So that's true in, in all children. Actually, this, I think the, the, the title on this slide should just be uh, hormone levels in XY boys throughout childhood. So just thinking about that neonatal surge, the LH, FSH, and testosterone levels are actually very similar to what you would see in late puberty. Then in childhood, from about six months of age until puberty starts, LH and F FSH and testosterone levels are very low. In fact, they're sometimes below the level of detection for the blood tests that we have. And then in puberty, uh, which can start anywhere from just after nine years of age to just before 14 years of age, those hormone levels get turned back on again. And the LH and FSH and testosterone levels rise from essentially undetectable levels up into that adult normal range. So uh, superimposing what's going on in boys with Klinefelter syndrome, so the solid lines are still the boys with an XY karyotype, the typical pattern, and then the dotted lines are what you'd typically see in a boy with an XXY karyotype. So we don't really know exactly what's going on with hormone levels in the fetus, so let's just say I don't know what's going on there. Um, during the neonatal surge, LH and FSH levels are identical to other boys. There's absolutely no difference in LH and FSH levels. Um, there may be a little bit uh, lower testosterone level, but it's actually pretty similar to what happens with other boys. In those middle childhood years, the hormone levels are indistinguishable between boys with an XY carry type and boys with an XXY carry type. They're all just really low. And then as puberty starts, those hormone levels actually, again, look the same between boys with an XY carry type and those with an XXY carry type until you get towards the middle of puberty or so when you start having this divergence where the LH and FSH levels definitely rise. And the testosterone level either falls a little bit or it stops rising up to the, um, uh, the higher levels that you might see in, in the general population. So then in the end, you are left with LH and FSH levels that are clearly above the normal range. Testosterone levels, though, are often in the normal range. They're just the, the lower half of the normal range. Some of them may be below the normal range. But there's often this overlap with you know, low normal versus you know, slightly below the normal range. So you know, thinking in more detail about these uh, hormone levels throughout childhood. So in fetal development, again, we don't really have a lot of data about the actual hormone levels, but there is some evidence that there might be deficient testosterone production um, during fetal development in boys with XXY. Um, that would be first that the penis is often smaller than average, although it is usually within the normal range, and there's an increased rate of undescended testes in these boys. And both of those are testosterone-driven processes. So looking at a little bit of data, you know, this is just one study that looked at penis size in boys, in uh, infants with an XXY carry type. And the, um, the normal range, you know, is shown in the brackets there. And as you can see, you know, all of these boys had a penis size within the normal range as an infant. Some of them were above average, but most of them were below average you know, again, highlighting that there is a smaller penis size in these boys. Now, this is really at high risk of having an ascertainment bias because 
many of these boys, the reason they were identified as having Kleinfelter syndrome was because the penis was smaller than average, and that was a driving force for it. So I think you really have to be cautious in interpreting it. But I think, you know, the data probably is sufficient to say that there is some deficient testosterone production in utero, um, uh, but it's not, it's not so dramatic that it leads to abnormal genital formation that we see in other disorders that have more severe deficiencies in testosterone production. Now, with regard to this neonatal surge, again, at about two to six months of age, it sort of looks like puberty in, in uh, boys. LH and FSH levels rise, testosterone levels rise. Um, when you look at testosterone levels during this neonatal surge, they're usually in the normal range, but they're on the lower normal side. On the other hand, the LH level is absolutely normal. And if the testosterone level for that individual child was actually lower than that child's body wanted it to be, you would have expected the LH level to be high. So this is a slide, you know, again, somebody else's research looking at it. And, you know, when you look at testosterone levels, the shaded blue area is what you see in the general population of infant boys. And you can see that the testosterone levels in the XXY boys, the little dots within there, are generally speaking within that shaded area. The few that are outside are what you would see if you actually studied individual patients. Um, so really the testosterone levels are within that normal range, although you know, I think you can look at the pattern and see that you know, there's not too many that are up in that higher level. Most of them are kind of in the lower half of that, that normal range. But when you look over at the LH, and again, the LH is really kind of our you know, uh, guide to whether that individual is making the testosterone that they think they should be making. The LH levels are completely normal. You know, there, aren't, there, there isn't an elevation in LH levels that would really suggest that that neonatal surge is deficient. So it's very hard to know how to interpret you know, the sort of low, uh, lower than average testosterone levels in this neonatal surge. Um, during childhood, again, uh, as with all boys, in boys with XXY, LH, FSH, and testosterone are low, again, often undetectable, and it's no different in XXY boys compared to, XY, uh, to XY boys. And in particular, the lack of LH elevation here is a very strong indication that there isn't testosterone deficiency going on at this age. So in, with regards to puberty in boys with Klinefelter syndrome, the timing of onset of puberty is an, is an inherited trait. And it can be inherited from mom, it can be an inherited from dad. Um, and that's the same in boys with Klinefelters as it is in XY boys. There's no difference in that. The timing of the onset of puberty in boys with Klinefelters is the same as the general population. As in all boys, the first sign of puberty is an increase in the size of the testes. So this is something that the physicians should be noticing and not the parents, and usually the children don't notice it either. So it's a physical exam finding, um, but that's the first sign of puberty. The development of pubic hair sometimes actually isn't connected to puberty. There's another process that can normally produce pubic hair development even in the absence of puberty. Um, and as a sign of puberty, it's actually a later sign of puberty than that increase in testicular size. So that increase in testicular size happens in boys with Klinefelter syndrome just as in other boys. So ultimately, we know that the testicular size in men with Klinefelters is small. Um, but that increase in testicular size that happens at the beginning of puberty is just the same in boys with Klinefelters as it, as it is in other boys. So that's not something that you could pick up on as, um, as a feature of a boy with Klinefelters. Um, and then early in puberty, those hormone levels are the same in boys with Klinefelters compared to boys with an XY carry type. LH and FSH levels and testosterone levels rise from undetectable levels up to the normal pubertal levels for early puberty. But pretty much invariantly, we see evidence of testicular failure in these boys with Klinefelter syndrome. 
what we usually will see is the first sign of testicular failure being a rise in the FSH level to a level that's above the adult normal range. And this is an indication that there's a beginning of failure of sperm production. Sometime after that, we'll start seeing a rise in LH levels to levels above the adult normal range. And that's an indication that the testes are starting to have trouble keeping up with making as much testosterone as that individual um, uh, is trying to make. As has been uh, emphasized uh, a number of times, there's a lot of challenges about, you know, the testosterone normal range. And it's particularly difficult to be interpreting testosterone levels in adolescence because the normal range for testosterone in a boy that's between nine and say 15 years of age is essentially zero to a thousand because some of those boys, some of boys in just the general population will be, you know, will not have started puberty or be in very early puberty, even up to 14 years of age. So a level of zero could be normal. On the other hand, a boy that starts puberty at nine might have a testosterone level of 1,000 at 11 or 12 years of age. So that's why that testosterone level isn't really um, an easy thing to interpret in boys during puberty and why we really rely on that LH level to tell us, you know, is there normal testosterone production or not? And that's why that rise in LH above that normal range is our indication that the testes isn't making as much testosterone as the body's trying to, to have. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, again, this is looking at um, uh, uh, hormone levels throughout childhood, looking at, um, you know, FSH, LH, and testosterone. And unfortunately, the normal ranges aren't showing up well on the project projection, so I'll try and uh, highlight them for you. But, you know, the, the thing to be aware of is that, you know, in prepubertal boys in the blue, FSH levels are low, and that's within the normal range. LH levels are low, that's within the normal range. And testosterone levels are low, that's within the normal range. At the start of puberty, what we refer to as Tanner 2, FSH levels are a little bit higher, but they're still, you know, relatively low, but they're elevated into that pubertal range and they're in the normal range in boys with XXY. LH levels are now a little bit higher, and they're in the normal range at the start of puberty. And testosterone levels are a little bit higher, and they're in the normal range. The normal range for testosterone levels would be from here to about here. So they're, you know, in these three boys, I mean, it's a very small sample, they're on the lower normal range. But I would say in, in very early puberty, the full range of testosterone levels are seen from, from you know, relatively low levels to, to you know, the higher end of what you'd expect for early puberty. But when you get to middle to late puberty, then you start seeing these hormone abnormalities. So for FSH levels, the normal range goes up to the top of the arrow here. So you see that you know, most of these boys have elevated FSH levels, and some of them are markedly elevated. So in these boys, the testes are clearly having trouble with sperm production. And then as you look at LH levels, the upper limit for the normals would be about here. And for most of these boys, the LH level is elevated above the normal range, indicating for that child, it's not making as much testosterone as the brain and pituitary gland are expecting or trying to make. But then when you look at the testosterone levels, where the normal range um, is from this point up to this point, you can see that generally there's a very big spread of those testosterone levels that span that entire normal range. You know, there's a couple of boys, those two at the bottom, who clearly have low testosterone levels but the vast majority of them have testosterone levels within that broad normal range. Now we know that most of them are trying to make more testosterone than they are because their LH level is high, but again, their testosterone level is actually normal in the vast majority of them. So as Dr. Fernoy was alluding to, it gets challenging trying to decide and trying to know what 
are we, what are the benefits going to be of testosterone treatment? Because that's ultimately what we're trying to figure out. I mean, yes, as physicians and scientists, you know, we like to discover things and learn things and understand how things really are. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is also figure out how to help the individuals. And the question related to testicular function is how do we help these individuals related to testicular function, the two functions that they're supposed to do, which is make testosterone and make sperm. Um, now, kind of addressing some of the questions that I've heard both this morning and this afternoon, um, we'll talk about this issue of testosterone treatment. I think the, the question about whether testosterone treatment is beneficial in adults is unambiguous for all of the reasons that you're aware of, you know, bone health, body composition, sexual function. For all of those reasons, adults with Klinefelter syndrome benefit from testosterone treatment. It does. It does. And maybe I'll address that a little bit later, um, and specifically how we, we think about that. So testosterone treatment for adults definitely makes sense. Um, when we think about um, the treatment of testicular failure in adolescents with Klinefelter syndrome, um, one of the things that um, I think is important to factor in is this issue that there's two functions of the testes that we're concerned about, testosterone production and sperm production. So with regards to sperm production, we know that ultimately, you know, men with Klinefelter syndrome are infertile, at least with, um, uh, without assistance. But we do know that now the urologists are getting really good at helping these individuals to father children. Um, so that referral to a urologist, even if it's just to have a discussion about fertility options and issues, is appropriate. And we make those referrals, so, you know, basically as the child is just beginning puberty. There's probably not a lot of benefit to start those discussions before the child starts puberty because it's already a pretty early thing for an a adolescent to be thinking about. And there's nothing to do until the child has started puberty. But as soon as puberty starts, that's, you know, very shortly after that is when sperm production starts. And so considerations about, you know, what can be done in terms of long-term fertility preservation is appropriate. So that's the first step in following a child in adolescence in my mind. The next question is testosterone replacement. As long as the LH is normal, my feeling is that that's really strong evidence that that individual is making as much testosterone as they need. Even if, this even if their testosterone level is zero, if their LH level is normal, their body isn't looking for any more testosterone at that point in time. So my approach is to follow the LH level, and when the LH level is elevated, I mean, that's the first indication to me that there's evidence of testosterone deficiency. That's not the same exact thing as saying that's the time for testosterone treatment. It's saying that's the first evidence of testosterone deficiency, and it certainly is appropriate to start considering testosterone treatment at that time. But as we've been highlighting and discussing, there's a broad range of testosterone levels in adult men and certainly in adolescents. And at this point, we actually don't really know whether there are absolute benefits of changing the testosterone level from, say, 350 to 450? Um, I think that's an important question, and hopefully over time we're going to learn that. But the reality is right now we don't know that that's different in an adolescent. Over time, in adults, it's important, but whether it's important to start that right as soon as the LH is elevated or just sometime um, in early adulthood, we don't know. I think the other thing to, to keep in mind here is that testosterone treatment is going to suppress sperm production. So, in, in, um, uh, so you know, we know that. I mean, it, it acts through that same feedback mechanism. So you need that active hypothalamus-pituitary axis to stimulate sperm production. If you get, give testosterone from an external source, 
it turns down the LH and FSH and that turns down that stimulus for sperm production. So in an adolescent, an important thing to do is decide what you want to do about fertility preservation. Because if you're going to do some sperm retrieval and storage, you'd want to do that before you start testosterone treatment. Now that's not to say that you can't do those same things after testosterone treatment has been started, but you'd almost certainly stop the testosterone in anticipation of, of doing that sperm retrieval. In addition, I think one of the big research questions that we don't know about is what is the effect of testosterone tr treatment at around that time of early adolescence as sperm production is perhaps a little bit better than it is in the future in adulthood. So certainly around this time frame, you know, one of the questions is to address fertility preservation before you start testosterone treatment. And if you've decided to go for sperm retrieval and storage, delay testosterone treatment until after that takes place. So, I'm going to leave with um, a bunch more questions, um, all of which you guys have asked us. So I'm going to just put it out there and show you that these are questions that we still have. Um, and there aren't answers to. Um, there are, you know, some thoughts and opinions, but not really answers. So, you know, one question, as I've just alluded to, is, is there a benefit to start treating with testosterone as soon as the LH rises, as opposed to later? a year, two years, three years later. We don't know. No. So, 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 that, no, I mean, I think those are, those are important questions. You know, is there benefit to testosterone treatment in adolescence before puberty even starts? So, you know, should you start testosterone treatment at a given age? 10, 11, 12, 13, rather than waiting for the LH to rise. You know, maybe that is an advantage. You know, maybe it'll decrease the, the um, amount of gynecomastia that a boy would have. Maybe it'll improve psychosocial function. Maybe it'll decrease their final height, especially in the taller boys where too much height might be a problem. Maybe it'll improve adult body composition. Now, I think one of the things I would mention here is I can pretty much guarantee that when you give an individual testosterone, it's going to improve their body composition. That, you know, it, yes, you'd have, you have to do the studies to prove it, but I can anticipate that that's going to happen. The question isn't so much does that happen when you treat them. So in a boy, does it happen when you treat them? But does that change where they are when they're 20, 25, 30? Is it any different if you start it when they're 10 compared to when they're 20? And I don't, we don't know that answer. So that's an important question. I often wonder if you know, the anxiety and the sensory and the ab, ab, you know, that, those are all very good questions. And you know, some of the so you know, uh, let's let's you know finish the questions and then we'll open it up. You know, is there benefit to testosterone or other androgen treatment, oxandrolone, in childhood, you know, after infancy but before puberty? Does that improve neuropsychological function? Does it improve body composition? I mean, these are important questions. Obviously, Dr. Ross's study is starting to try and get at that. Um, but, you know, I think at this point, I'm not sure we have a definitive answer to that. It is an important question. Now, I think, you know, one thing to put out there is just a reminder that there's more things going on in Klinefelter syndrome than just testicular failure, right? We know there's testicular failure ultimately. And we know that in adults, there's a benefit of testosterone replacement. But there's also an extra chromosome. You know, there is that extra X chromosome. And almost certainly some of the features and some of the concerns that are going on in these individuals is related to the fact that there is that extra X chromosome. So tall stature is probably the easiest one. That almost certainly is directly related to the fact that there's an extra X chromosome. And it is possible, and you know, I think it's probably likely that many of the neuropsychological issues are related to just having that extra X chromosome, which may or may not be amenable to treatment with testosterone. And then, um, backing up even further in childhood, is there benefit to testosterone treatment during infancy, during this neonatal surge? And again, is this going to improve their neuropsychological function? Is it going to improve their adult body composition? 
And kind of even breaking that down even further, if you're going to treat during infancy, do you treat all of the infants that you identify with Kleinfelter syndrome? Or do you treat just some of them? Perhaps the ones where there's maybe better evidence of early testosterone deficiency, like those boys that have a penis that's on the smaller range of the normal range, or those boys that have undescended testes, both of which would be evidence of, um, uh, uh, of lower um, in utero testosterone levels. So these are you know, all questions that we really don't have answers to. I mean, we're starting to get some of them, and certainly Dr. Ross and Dr. Tartaglia and others are really trying very hard to address these unanswered questions and, and get them for us. But right now, I don't know that we have an answer to them. Um, everything in medicine we do, it's a weighing of risks and benefits, right? Now, if there was no benefit to, of testosterone treatment at all, we definitely wouldn't do it. Um, uh, we know ultimately there are benefits. So right now we're trying to decide, are there benefits to starting earlier than, than adulthood? Um, but then you have to balance that with the question of risks. And, you know, the bottom of the slide is, you know, are there unknown risks? And I can't tell you what those unknown risks are because they're unknown. So I don't know. But I think one of the maybe simple risks to think about is the possibility that early testosterone treatment might actually work against us in terms of fertility preservation. You know, maybe even testosterone treatment in that neonatal surge might alter the testicular development and the sperm production at that, that time frame. I think we just don't know. And it's something that's important to, to, to think about and study as we begin these things. So let me just say one more thing before we start taking questions, because we actually got a fair amount of time for questions. Um, just directing that issue of the LH and FSH levels um, and, you know, what, what we would do with them as we start treatment. Um, the FSH, you know, that's not going to be a useful thing to follow because that's a marker of sperm production and unfortunately we don't have a way of improving sperm production. Um, but uh, one thing that could be done is use the LH to guide the amount of testosterone you give. So you could give testosterone until the LH comes back down into the normal range. Now, you couldn't do that with the injectable form of testosterone because as you've heard about, the testosterone levels go up and down between the, the doses. But that's one of the advantages of um, using the longer acting preparations, the, the gels or patches or, or oral formulations, is you get more steady levels. And in theory, you could use that LH level to guide you. Um, but I don't know that that's the answer. I mean, the, that's, a, an, um, uh, that's a worthwhile research question. I haven't seen evidence that even in adults, adjusting testosterone level to get the LH level into any particular range has advantages over getting the testosterone level into a particular range. So it's, it's an interesting question and one that I suspect that will be answered over time, but I, I haven't seen evidence of it. Yeah, yeah, no, it, and that's always a question. Now, the reality is, us endocrinologists, we like to treat the labs. We are, we're very numbers oriented, so we often do. But we do have to step back and think, well, what's the advantage to the individual? And is there an advantage to the individual of just correcting the number? So looks like there's a few questions here. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to take them. And you know, Dr. Fenoy is still here. And I'd be happy to share the floor with her for, for answering. We can kind of have a, 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 shared, uh, a shared response here, uh, especially. I, I would definitely ask you to speak up if you have a different answer to, to than something that, that I would say. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> and I, I have no idea how to go around here. So we'll, we'll start over here. Um, is there any side effect to having high levels of LH and FSH in your blood? Well, I, yeah, no, it's a great question. We don't think so. We don't think that they're causing any other effects other than markers of testosterone deficiency. Um, so I, I would probably do them more often. So it depends on where you are in your stage. Um, uh, I would say probably more like every six months as you're starting to decide on this issue of when is the right time for testosterone therapy. 
but without any data to support that. But you know, early on when it's clear that puberty hasn't started, then you know, you know, every 12 months, but maybe sh shortening down to every six months makes sense. We'll go all the way in the back. It's a much it's a much tighter range. So it, it depends a little bit from lab to lab, even with the LH levels. But you know, typically the normal range for adults is what maybe two to ten, I think. And an individual where the testes are not working to make testosterone, the LH level might get up to 30, 40, 50. So it's a more um, uh, sort of black and white normal abnormal. And that's, that's why it becomes a much more useful marker of deficient testosterone production. And similarly, the FSH is the same way. The normal range is pretty tight, and you're, you can be very confident when the level is above the normal range. So the FSH, that won't really, once you start testosterone therapy, that's not going to affect the FSH. FSH Correct. Correct. So my approach with my, so, so I, I don't know the best answer. If I knew the best answer, I would say, this is what you do. I can tell you my approach. My approach is as the LH level becomes elevated, and that's a marker that there's at least some biochemical evidence of testosterone deficiency, then I have a discussion with the child and the parents, and we discuss what the likely differences to expect with testosterone treatment are explore with them whether they're having some symptoms or other evidence that their testosterone level is causing them problems, and talk about with them what testosterone treatment would mean. So I think one of the other things to factor in, in terms of you know, maybe anxiety and you know, sort of uh, neuropsychological issues, is that you know, I can't speak for everybody, but generally speaking, adolescents would prefer not to be doing things, not to have to take medicines, and not be asked to do medical things. They'd like to ignore everything. And so by telling them they have to take a medicine, you know, there's at least some potential that that's actually you know, doing some harm to them. And if they're not getting any benefit, why put them through taking a medicine that's not making a difference? So we talk about you know, what you can expect with therapy and you know, decide with the child whether it's time for them or not. Now, I think there's, there are some relatively clear indications in my mind in that if the testosterone level after going up starts coming down and actually gets below the adult normal range, then I would strongly recommend testosterone therapy in that individual. But that's probably the least, I, I haven't seen that very often. You know, in fact, I'm not sure I've seen a testosterone level that's been below the adult normal range in a mid to late pubertal Klinefelter syndrome child. So it's a discussion based on both the lab tests and my expectations for what testosterone therapy would do and how the child feels about initiating therapy. And you know, oftentimes it just means we kind of give the child some time to work into feeling comfortable with the idea of therapy. Um, so you know, six months or so we, we, after we start the conversation, it gets started. How, how about you? What, what, what are your thoughts on that?
and, and how convenient that we actually have our urologist with us. <laughs> so, so Pravin, why don't you, what's your thoughts? So, you know, again, that's sort of an unanswered question, whether testosterone treatment, well, probably the best way to say it is whether the success rate of sperm retrieval is best if you do it before any testosterone treatment or if it's unchanged by testosterone treatment. We don't know that, but that's one of the research questions. And I think that gets at what we were just saying, that, you know, that's one of the potential uh, risks of testosterone treatment, particularly I would wonder about that effect in sort of the developing time frames of the neonatal surge and that early um, uh, pubertal time frame. So that's a, that's a question. But, but, but I think the issue is I don't know that we have enough studies to have confidence in that yet. So I don't know the data perfectly, but I, you know, when you saw that earlier slide, you know, the azospermia wasn't 100%. So I don't know the data, but I suspect that there are individuals that have fathered children. No, you know, and I, I, I think the other way to, uh, yeah, you know, the other way to think about that is that there's a lot of aspects of life, and, and, and what weight any piece of it plays in an individual is going to be variable, um, but, but it's, but it's complicated, so it, it makes balancing these things challenging.
Yeah, so, so, you know, we're a relatively young Kleinfelter Center. I mean, we've been going on for, what, four years now. And so we're, you know, you know, for us, you know, I think we're really still solidifying the clinical side of it. Um, and you have to have that solid clinical component before you can start generating the research because you need the patients. So, you know, at this point, you know, I'd say it's too early to say where our research is going to go other than, you know, adding on to, you know, other groups in the near future and expanding our, our focus. Now, I think the, the biggest area of focus that right now we're contemplating is probably fertility related. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to look over to, to Dr. Rao, but uh, yeah, you know, generally I think the data would say that the sperm production is better, you know, at the sort of middle of puberty and then it starts fading over time. You know, how that translates into successful future, you know, fathering, I think is the uncertain question. Let's, let's. I'm sorry, the question was? Oh, no, so I, I think that. I, I, So, so what, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me jump in, because one or two more questions, because we're just about out of time. So.
So I, 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 I don't know what the u utilization of that cohort is going to be. So I, I'm not going to address the, the approach to testosterone treatment in adults. I don't know that and I don't do it. And uh, there hasn't been any official guidelines for testosterone replacement in Kleinfelders in terms of how to, to make those decisions in pediatric patients. Uh, no, I don't think I've seen anything specific. In, in other situations, it's a little more cut and dried. It's they make it or they don't make it. There's not much in pediatrics other than Kleinfeld's is where they're making low levels. So I don't know that there's a corollary. So you had a question? So the, so the uh, role of testosterone in behavior, I think, is an open question. Uh, so I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I think it's not likely that leg pains are related to testosterone deficiency. Leg pains in children are actually pretty common. Um, so I suspect not. But obviously, I don't know your child, so I'm not sure. You know, we, yeah, you know, we have not. It's a great question, and I think it's a very valid concern. Uh, and we are kind of stuck with the whole time issue that, you know, this we think is the best time to, to try and retrieve the sperm. We don't know for sure, but we think that it might be beneficial to try now versus later. But I agree. I think that's, a, that's an important question. The challenge, as we kind of uh, have discussed earlier and that we sort of know in medicine is, you know, what do you do in the absence of data in the individual that doesn't have time to wait for the data to be developed? And you have to just make the best judgment. Um, so I would say that kind of on an individual basis and uh, so I think the, the first goal would be to try and get an ejaculated specimen and see if there's sperm there. That would be the easiest thing. Um, but if there's azospermia in that sample, then yes. One, one, last, one last question. So we, we, we have not really set up a direct collaboration, um, although I would agree that over time that's going to be an appropriate thing to do. Again, we're, we're still, you know, getting our feet set in what we're doing. So I, 